Hello and welcome. We're going to be looking at in this video as we're going to be looking at historical and European contexts for texts and literature. Now, the reason why we're looking at these texts is because of the simple fact that a lot of texts that you will be reading from these contexts have been written almost centuries ago. In fact, in many cases they have been written centuries ago. And so you must learn their context in order to understand what it is they're actually referring to directly. Okay, so particularly if you're looking at Renaissance culture compared to now, there's a huge, huge difference between the sorts of values, attitudes, and systems in place, which essentially will um, inform your point of view and certainly will help you to understand a lot of perspectives, a lot of um, references being made in that text at that particular period, especially if you're doing Shakespeare. Okay, as the majority of texts you will study as well are European, we're going to be looking at it in terms of the European movements and European contexts. So, as in a lot of the texts that were basically written a couple of hundred years ago in English are all going to be uh, from European writers. So, either works that have been translated or works that were originally written in English. Okay, so let's look at the first period, which is basically the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance um, went through different periods at different times, and certainly it went through... Uh, Italy in the middle, in, sorry, in the beginning of the 16th century, and it went to England towards the end of the 16th century. So there was about an 80 year gap between it um, existing in um, Italy and in terms of Britain, and it just took a long time to spread. And basically, it was sto it represented stories in a classical style, as in it was a rebirth of the high culture and the high values that existed in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And highlight a lot of the themes and storylines from that um, particular period. And the most prominent forms of, um, of literature at this time were drama and poetry. So there weren't really novels. I mean, this was just at the beginning of the, uh, the printing press and just at its inception. So in terms of the Renaissance and what it did for modern literature, it was a rebirth of it. And it moved away from the medieval... Um, sort of lethargy towards um, documenting anything. And it became a much grander realization that um, human culture could be so much more than a couple of lords leading um, over some farmers and villagers. Okay, so contextually it was influenced by the end of feudal medieval life. So those sort of values that now have been finally put to rest and uh, culture in particularly in Europe and in Britain for that matter had suddenly become significant again. And when you're talking about basically what was occurring during that time, it was occurring um, not only to uh, the highers up, the ones who could afford education, but even some of the lower ends of the scale were starting to be included in a cultural rebirth and started to really embrace new cultures. And certainly when they say new cultures, of course they're referring to old cultures from Rome and, and Greece. It was the invention of the printing press, as I mentioned before. So it allowed texts to be spread, particularly in terms of poetry and in terms of drama. A lot more people could read manuscripts than what they previously could. Of course, before the printing press was invented, everything had to be hand copied. So if you were to write a book, you'd have to copy every version of that book by hand. And often this was done in terms of the Bible, and it was done by scholars and monks who were trained to be writers, and basically they would rewrite the the Holy Bible over and over and over again by hand. Very tedious process and um, certainly probably wouldn't have been good for the wrist, but at least got the point across, whereas with the invention of the printing press, they could actually start printing those books on a very slow and very um, menial sort of scale compared to what you can do now, but at least it was progress. The cultural rebirth, as I said before, of uh, not only literature, but music and art as well. So it started to really see music be injected into the life space, and certainly in terms of art as well. But also in terms of drama, it became something that wasn't just a community um, playhouse performance. It was something that was being introduced in the cities. And certainly in the case of Shakespearean works, they weren't being shown in tiny little theatres. They were being shown in the Globe, the great big theatre in the middle of London, or in the middle of um, the sort of cultural epicentre of England. And... Um, in terms of basically uh, what it, it meant was that uh, culture was starting to um, build in terms of scale. It wasn't just a small thing performed by court jesters. It was something that was um, 
uh, much deeper and, and certainly um, started to permeate and started to become available towards the masses as well. And finally, it was also represented the humanist quest for human perfection, as in that's what Renaissance was about, was sort of trying to finish what the Greeks and Romans started in terms of questing for human perfection. So as in trying to do things the best way they could be possibly done. So with these new technologies, and certainly with things such as the printing press, for instance, um, you started to see a culture that was starting to really build technologically and was starting to um, find a lot of ways in which, I guess, the human mind and the human will could be improved. Now, in terms of authors in this period, you'll see, certainly see guys like uh, Shakespeare and John Donne, uh, but you also see uh, authors like Marlowe and Sir Thomas More as well. And a lot of them were ones who broke away from um, the church and the church's way of, of um, basically uh, representing things. And certainly uh, it was a movement. It was a, it was a new movement of cultural expression. And certainly these, these um, contributors were quite strong in basically um, removing English literature and indeed European literature from the Dark Ages which preceded it. And certainly in terms of what um, writing and, and literature was about, particularly prior to that period, was entirely religious. It was entirely for religious purposes. There was no um, emphasis on creating new stories. There was in, in villages and there certainly was in, in communities and communities would all tell their own stories, but it wasn't really um, put into print until um, basically the printing press meant that not only was the Bible being pr printed on a greater scale, but so were these other works. All right, moving on from there, we go into the Enlightenment. Now, the Enlightenment is basically a celebration of the scientific knowledge and the human mind as well. So, the power of the human mind. And this was about the time that Isaac Newton was coming into prominence. So, a lot of the texts started to really embrace science and these new discoveries that people like Newton were discovering about, um, about the laws of nature, the laws of uh, physics and the rest. Okay, so it was in... It was basically um, contextually influenced by science, science and industry born from the Renaissance. So it was a continuation, to some extent, of some of the things that had started the Renaissance, particularly the emphasis on technology and the, the growth of technology. It was a movement away from the church as well. With all these new technologies, it basically gave an excuse for, um, for a lot of new writers and a lot of... Uh, new literists to basically move away from some values of the church. So it was a, a continuation, as I said, in that regard, although it did sort of rebel from some, against some of the aspects of Renaissance literature. The Industrial Revolution also started at this time. So the, um, the power of the machine had really started to, um, and particularly in, in terms of industry, really started to sort of show the, the, the human mind and the human construct of advancement um, was really starting to move into its fore and basically we'd moved away from a period of 400 years where everything remained the same and suddenly things were changing, things were evolving, things were improving. Um, there was growth in literacy and availability of books, so as in because the printing press, books were now becoming available to more than just the elite and more, to, more than just the people of the church. It was becoming available to others and through that others were starting to learn to read so they could start to take in books. So basically the masses were starting to become educated and educated by more than just the church. So not only was it a um, growth in, in the human mind and what it can do, but basically science and, and industry had meant that others had been able to in, embrace that as well. And this includes at, at such time authors such as Rousseau, uh, Swift, Pope, and there are a few others as well. Most of the writers at this time were concerned with uh, building scientific knowledge and they incorporated literature into that. Um, but in terms of the movement, it was particularly important for what was to come in terms of um, not only those which counted it, but also uh, basically in, in feeding um, new technology and feeding the way for more writers and more literacists to come after this point. So a lot of Romanticist, which is the movement that comes next, would actually basically refer to enlightenment as a, a source of inspiration, even if it was just to rebel against it. Okay, and speaking of romanticism, 
Romanticism, as I mentioned, is the style that followed Enlightenment and draws a bit from it, but also basically completely goes against it too. So it's considered it's concerned with the individual rather than society. Now, in terms of the Industrial Revolution, it was about what society could do to further advance itself, whereas this was sort of going, well, hang on, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to focus on making ourselves better. And it started to actually go back towards the values of the Renaissance, which sort of valued these classic ideas and um, classical ways of thinking and also a return to nature as well. So it was a focus on spirituality and consciousness rather than science. And certainly it was almost a protest against science and the fact that science had sort of sucked all the fun out of the world. Okay, so it can be contextually defined as basically being a literary and artistic rebellion, not just literary, um, against scientific thought. So um, all these scientists that were basically ruining the world in their eyes because of the fact that um, everything was being judged on how it could be made more efficient. And yet it basically undermines what nature is, which is um, things being free and expressing themselves in their own way. You don't see um, trees trying to work out how they can grow themselves more efficiently. They just do their own thing. And so that was essentially the romanticist way of thinking. Um, A loosening of artistic rules as well. So it got rid of the rigidity of a lot of writing structures that came before it, and particularly in terms of poetry. So poetry used to be very, very structured and very much set up to um, iambic um, meters and metameters and the rest, whereas this had started to really um, diminish at this point and really became more about free expression and and free-form writing. Uh, A yearning for the classical and natural world. So it basically, it went back to what the Renaissance was about initially, which was rediscovering that um, classical world where basically nature does have a, has a, have a role to say. And it can include many um, authors that you will be looking at, certainly ones like um, the Shelleys, in terms of Mary Shelley, author of Frankenstein and her husband Percy, um, uh, John Keats, Edgar Allan Poe, Wordsworth, Blake, all of those authors as well were very prominent around about this time and started to really um, see this expansion in terms of ideas and certainly emotional storytelling as well. And this is the other thing that also explores, started to explore emotions a lot more deeply. So romanticism basically um, brought the humanity, I guess, back to writing again when it had been previously influenced by science. Okay, so let's look now at transcendentalism. And basically, it's a style which is, uh, again, another conflict, another movement away, and is more skeptical and nihilistic, um, a self-driven style of questioning perceptions and, and basically the personal and sensory explanation of the world. What essentially that means is that it's completely skeptical of um, institutional values beforehand and starts to really draw a lot of questions. And particularly, it draws a lot of, it asks a lot of questions of European society. This is a movement that particularly picked up in America. And it picked up around about the time of the, um, the Declaration of Independence and um, essentially really sort of started to pick up as the American system of human rights really picked up as well. But also had its roots in European um, standings as well. So it was culturally influenced by, first of all, America's rise in power. And it was starting to gradually become a nation. Even though it hadn't quite formed, it was growing in power and stature. Um, it was also based on Kant's philosophies that humans cannot know all. And he was a German philosopher, and basically um, he, he preached, and his philosophies were that there were things that humans were not meant to know, things that humans were not able to understand. And this is a movement, again, away from um, enlightenment and scientific thought, where it, there was the belief at the time that everything could be found. It could be an answer to everything found. Um, Enlightenment was supposed to find out what God was and be able to find him. Um, Whereas this was basically a movement away from that to say that there are some mysteries and that basically there are certain perceptions which you can question and only in the sense that people look at the world through their own eyes and through their own system of values, which basically formed a lot of the basis for what... um, the American sort of philosophy was, and certainly when it came to America's um, independence, 
uh, it, it, it certainly informed a lot of the values that were in its constitution, its Bill of Rights and so forth. Um, the questions of women's suffrage and slavery as well, this was a sort of a little bit um, ahead of its time in terms of thinking and that it basically also started to really look quite deeply at, um, at uh, the, the human rights of women and human rights of uh, African American slaves at the time. And this was only a short-lived movement. It, it was one that really informed a lot of values of the coming eras. And yet, um, it is, is pretty much lost to history in a, lot of, in a lot of ways as well. And it does include certain authors that you would know as well. So ones like Emerson, Thoreau, uh, Emily Dickinson, and, and Fuller. And they basically died with these people. They, the mo movement um, really struggled to continue on. And certainly, uh, this sort of skepticism and certainly this, um, this anti-institutional uh, attitude was one that really didn't carry on once these authors were uh, unable to continue sort of penning works which represented those ideas. Okay, moving on. Victorianism is basically, now it's a very difficult movement to talk about because there's no real clear still state of mind in this movement except that most of the works were written about the time that Queen Victoria in England uh, sat on the throne, and basically it highlights the good and bad of progress, mostly the bad, where stories focus on inequality and the dark side of industrialism, and basically really continues on with that narrative that's sort of been built from the, the previous sorts of movements. And there was basically, it was a giant protest movement. It was a giant protest movement of literature, which really started to question a lot of the so-called good that was being done. Now, you have to imagine at this particular point in time, but the Industrial Revolution was really very much in full scale now, that most people were no longer working in farming villages, but they were starting to work in factories. And they were starting to work in, uh, in cities. They were starting to all migrate towards the city. And of course, when everyone was trying to come to the city at once, there was absolutely zero infrastructure for them. There was, no, um, there was nowhere for them to live. There was nowhere for them to, um, to wash and to bathe. And there was absolutely zero sanitation as well. So a lot of the conditions that a lot of these people were coming to live in were absolutely shocking. They stunk, they were full of disease, they um, spread plagues very, very quickly. And this essentially became the dark side of industrialism and the dark side of human progress. That it essentially was starting to kill a lot of people and people were having very miserable sorts of lives. And even worse than that, were that it basically um, leading up to, in the beginning of particularly the Victorian era, um, it involved child workers, and so certainly within about the middle point of that era, where when child workers were sent to school instead of um, sent to factories, and basically that led to another change, but again, more aspects of human life at that time were being sort of protested against, and it was really literature that stuck up for the common man. So... It was basically influenced by, as I said before, Queen Victoria's um, reign and this age of so-called progress and, and phenomenal progress. Things were really increasing quite quickly. Um, and we're starting to see things introduced like electricity and, and all these um, other new technologies which really accelerated the rate of human progress. Um, but it also led to a basically a great social hub evil as well. As in, as I mentioned before, people were now being um, sent to live in cities. And there was a chronic problem, first of all, with unemployment, as in not everyone could get work in factories. And second of all, as I mentioned before, the sanitation problems, the disease, the, um, the various things that basically killed a lot of people very, very quickly. And uh, this social upheaval basically meant that it was almost unsustainable. And certainly in terms of these slums, in terms of these really rotten areas in which they were forced to live, um, was sort of this downside technology. The, the technology was attracting all these people and yet also killing them. Um, Darwin's fear of evolution. People at the top justified this at the time by this brand new theory that come along. Basically, Dar a man called Charles Darwin had come along saying that people had evolved and that it was survival of the fittest particularly. And this was a, a philosophy that was very much taken on board by a lot of those who were industrialists and basically said, well, if people are going to work in factories, then the strongest will survive. There we go. That, that proves that law of nature quite well. And, but at the same time, it was also 
a period where Darwin's theory of evolution had really started to come into consciousness. And there was also this sort of idea that people had now lost their God in certain um, specters or spectrums of society. So that uh, there's this, this contrasting theory that basically indicated that people had come from, from apes rather than from a divine spirit. And as I mentioned before, the poor living conditions and suffering was a huge part of this movement as well. And a lot of the work from particular authors was based on um, certain outrages and certain scandals that had come through. And particularly, the printing press was in full swing now. We had newspapers. We had uh, a lot of new writing technologies that meant information could be um, communicated a lot more quickly. And a lot of people suddenly became aware of a lot of the social issues and a lot of the social conditions that um, people were living in. There are also many, many authors that you'd be looking at from this period. So the Brontes, both, um, both sisters, um, Barrett Browning, Dickens, Wilde, Yeats, uh, Doyle, Tennyson. There's a, a huge range of artists that, or authors who um, basically came through this period. Um, and again, they were all sort of based roughly on this, on this new style and this way of thinking. Um, and this basically this dark side of industrialism is a, is a very frequent part as we sort of see this very savage portrayal of England and Europe as well. And finally, modernism. Now, modernism is probably the um, mode of thinking which is more in tune to what we have now. All right, it, it started in the early 20th century and basically it was a break from all traditions. It was where we left everything from the Victorian era behind and from previous eras for that matter. And individualism and experimentation became valued. Now, this was a movement that basically came to prominence after World War I. And the reason for that was that a lot of people and a lot of soldiers at the end of World War I who had come back from fighting in the trenches were so disenchanted with their lives, with what they were forced to do in the war, were so horrified by it and so shocked by it that they basically had to completely forget about the entire, um, their entire lives. They were people who were completely lost and disenchanted. And so for that reason, um, became a lot more individualistic, became far more distrusting, and became far more likely to um, engage in behavior that basically took them away from what happened. And this essentially started a whole new culture in the 1920s, or the Roaring Twenties, where basically people were more concerned with just having fun and forgetting the, the pain of the past, rather than just going back and living their ordinary lives like they once did. So it was essentially a time where they could um, get away from the things that they had done in the war and the things that they had seen, um, the, basically the horror of mass murder and, and, or mass killings, should I say, um, on, the, on the scale of World War I, and basically it, it shifted culture to something which was a lot more um, uh, sort of lively and, and, and spontaneous. Um, mass production and the rise of a mechanized society was also quite um, apparent at this point and something that still sort of continues on now where we look at how new technologies had um, start to influence uh, methods and modes of writing and modes of, of literature in general and different texts in general. Um, this was basically the beginning when, it, when modernism was first really um, studied as a concept and looked at as a concept. Um, things like the Model T Ford had come in and uh, mass production had become a huge part of society. So basically there was this, this value that things had suddenly become machine-like and um, that everything that was being done was being done in order to basically um, move towards a mechanized, mechanized future where uh, machines did all the work for humans and basically there was almost a bit of a resistance about that because it sort of removed the artistry from the world. Okay, the category of high and low art started to emerge as well. So basically when we refer to high and low art, we refer to low end trash and high art. So high art, which is basically very artistic, very creative, very new and avant-garde, and low art, which was essentially at the time what was called pulp fiction. And pulp fiction were very cheap books that were um, printed and basically left on newsstands for people to read on the train on their way to, on their commute to work. And it was a very sort of lowish style of art. They sort of recycled old stories again. They didn't really have a lot of creativity. They were even p printed on really rough sort of shoddy paper. Um, and 
basically at this point, you also start doing things like reproducing artworks, reproducing prints of artworks, which became low art, um, arts which weren't original, which basically people, um, it was essentially art of those who couldn't afford to have the high end art. And there was a bit of a, I guess, a cultural divide and class divide at this point between those who could afford to fit into the high society and those who tried to imitate that with, within, their own, with own, within their own means, basically. So this con category of high and low art came in as well. And basically, a complete resistance to Victorian values. This was complete and utter removal of all of that. And particularly at this point, things like sanitation and, and um, cities were starting to clean up. And certainly after World War I, cities were almost in many cases being forced to be rebuilt. So they were being rebuilt in a way that basically allowed um, a lot more, um, particularly in terms of sanitation, in terms of the transport, in terms of all these things. So in England and France in particular, um, their, their transport and sanitation networks had vastly improved. And so people could start living what we can call today relatively normal lives. So it's, again, all these things influence basically our modern way of thinking. And at this point, we really start to see the end of movements and start to see more people, individualistic styles. But in terms of the categories and things that influence texts up until this period, we really start to see the end of patterns and really the beginning of free expression. Now, authors at this particular point, we see F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, Ernest Hemingway, George Bernard Shaw, uh, Virginia Woolf, D.H. Lawrence, and among others. So really starting to see a variety, and even these um, authors and artists were, or composers, should I say, are all very different. So uh, in terms of what modernism brought, it basically brought an artistic freedom and an artistic style of expression that was just completely new and different and meant that from then on, from that point on, that we weren't really going to be thinking of things in isms anymore, but as in an, in, an author's or an artist's individual work. So that's basically what modernism brought. Now, in terms of all these things together, we have to look at it in terms of the summary. So um, what you need to do is you need to look at the history behind the text. And basically, um, if you're given a text which has been written, let's just say, before 1950, it's almost certain that it can be categorized in some sort of ism, in some sort of style. And by looking into the history of that style, you'll be able to find out more about the, hist the history um, the historical context and the society which influenced that text. Um, so what influence basically? So what sort of factors, how the society worked, how it operated, how people lived, the author themselves, all those things become much more dominant and um, particularly far more uh, detailed and at least detailed in the sense that you're able to get a little bit more information about it. And finally, how did the author think is another um, sort of a permutation from that movement, as in the movement influenced the way that the author fought, and certainly um, how the author contributed to that movement is something that's also quite um, important, and certainly if you're looking at it in terms of perspective, so if you look at something like Mary Shelley, for instance, um, she basically pioneered the Romanticist movement. She was the one who um, really saw its growth, and even though her husband also um, was quite prominent in it, in it growing. It was basically her novel which really started to bring not only romanticism but a number of other different styles to the fore. So you can look at it in terms of um, not only what the movement did but also what the author did as being part of that movement. And basically that's it for um, historical context. So until next time, I'll see you later.